Ecclesiastes is a book about life. It's a book about how people experience life and the way that we can find the most fulfillment and enjoyment out of life. We're going to see as we look through this book that life is a lot like these bubbles that I just blew. There's some big ones. There's some small ones. Some get carried to the right. Some get carried to the left. Some go out to the front. Some go up. Some go down. They're all blown about by the wind. Each bubble is slightly different, but in the end, they're all the same. They last but a moment, and then there's no trace that they ever existed. My grandfather used to talk about how no man was indispensable. I must have heard him talk about this dozens of times in my life, but it wasn't until I was in college and I came across the poem by Saxon White Kessinger entitled, uh, the Indis- There Is No Indispensable Man. Here's the poem, written in 1959. Sometimes when you're feeling important, sometimes when your ego is in bloom, Sometime when you talk, take it for granted, you're the best qualified in the room. Sometime when you feel that you're going, we leave an unfillable hole. Just follow these simple instructions and see how they humble your soul. Take a bucket and fill it with water. Put your hand in it up to your wrist. Pull it out and, that's the, hole, and the hole that's remaining is the measure of how much you'll be missed. You can splash all you wish when you enter. You may stir up the water galore, but stop and you'll find that in no time... It looks quite the same as before. The moral of this quaint example is do the best that you can. Be proud of yourself, but remember, there's no indispensable man. As we look at the book of Ecclesiastes over the next few weeks, we're going to see this play out. We're going to see that Solomon, the wisest man in the world, the one who is the leader over Jerusalem, the king of Israel, is going to put together thoughts from his life, from his experiences, from his wisdom. And what he's going to do as we look at this is he's going to encourage us, and yet at the same time, there's going to be some discouraging things. And, and the book is full of kind of a back and forth. And it's not really until we get to the end that we understand what he's really trying to show us. And really what he's trying to show us we can find in chapter 12. And so that's our memory verse for this series. And I'm going to ask uh, Harris to put it on the screen if we can. Chapter 12, maybe. Yep, there we go. So this is going to be our memory verse for this uh, sermon series. So let's read it together. And uh, as we're going through the series, we're, we're going to keep coming back to this because when we think about what Solomon is trying to tell us, in the end, this is the point. Here, let's read it together. Now all has been heard, Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandment, for this is the duty of all mankind. All right, let that in mind, let's jump in. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I invite you to stand if you have your Bible this morning, and let's read chapter 1. This is what the Word of the Lord says. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and it goes to the no- around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run into the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It, is already, it has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things later yet to be. 
among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been the king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great, a great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, while this might not be a, a book that we spend a lot of time in, it may not be a book that we read a lot of devotional thoughts from, Father, it is packed full of truth because you have said it. It is your word. And so, Father, because it's your word, we search for its riches today. We discover the treasures that are there. Father, I pray that you would speak to us from it. Father, may we take a moment during this series and pause and have a true and honest reflection of our lives what are we here for? Why do we exist? What is the purpose of life? How do I find meaning in life? What is the goal of life? How am I going to be remembered in my life? What does eternity look like? Father, I pray that these may be just some of the questions that you pose on our hearts as we reflect on your truth. And Father, ultimately, they, may they point us to the meaning and purpose of life, which is Jesus. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you. For you are my rock my Redeemer. I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There are a lot of different words used in the book of Ecclesiastes, so I want to kind of just start by giving you a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at. The, the word prophet, you're going to see this word repeated multiple times. It's used ten times in this book. The word labor, talking about work. So we work, we earn, we make, profit, and labor. The word labor is used 23 times. The word man is used 49 times. The word evil is used 31 times. The word joy or, re or enjoy is used 17 times. Wisdom is used 32 times, including when it talks about folly or fools. And 54 times specifically to wisdom itself. And then the word God, which is uh, the word translated Elohim. It's never used in this text as the word Jehovah. See, Elohim is the term for mighty God or glorious creator God. The one who exercises sovereign dominion and power. Jehovah is the God of covenant or relationship. So Solomon is talking exclusively about what he sees under the sun. And so he only uses Elohim, never Jehovah. It's not the relationship God. It's the glorious creator, mighty God that he, is, uh, that he uses in this passage or in, these, in this book. So kind of with that in mind, let's dig in and start to uncover some of these great truths. Look at verse, uh, chapter 1 with me, verse 1. It begins by saying, the preacher. Now that word preacher is the word kohel, koheleth. And it is the title given to an official speaker who calls together an assembly. So we see this kind of this preacher, the preacher, the preacher, the preacher. It is uh, this concept of somebody who gathers an audience. That's oftentimes people call me preacher. Why? Because we've gathered a congregation to listen to something that I'm going to say. This is where we also get the Greek word ekklesia, which means the assembly or the gathered or the called out ones. And this book title, Ecclesiastes, comes from this concept that the preacher, the wise one here, in this case Solomon, is gathering together people to listen to his wisdom. So we see, you begin by the words of the preacher and then we see Solomon identify himself. He never actually uses his name. He never says, this is Solomon. So it's not like the letters of Paul where he says, I, the Apostle Paul, write to you. 
he uses these other phrases that give us an extremely strong indication that he is the author of this text. First of all, we know in Kings that Solomon is the wisest man to live, the wisest human to live outside of Jesus. And we also know that he was obviously the son of David and the king over Israel. And so we see in verse 1 that he is the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now Solomon, being such a wise man, wrote this most likely towards the end of his life as he's looking back, as he's reflecting on all of his experiences, all the things that he's been through, the good times, the bad times, the the times when he walked closely with the Lord at the beginning of his kingship, at the beginning of his life, and then unfortunately looking back on the times where he drifted away from Yahweh and he began to pursue wives that were outside of Israel and When he did that, he began to adopt foreign and false gods and become an idol worshiper along with them and began to stray far away from the things of God. And he's now at the end of his life and he's writing wisdom about how and what life ought to be about. He's experienced the good things of God and he's also experienced what it's like to live far from God. He had all of the material possessions anybody could have ever dreamed about. He didn't want for anything He had all of the women and wives and relationships he could have possibly wanted. And yet, what he's going to see as we walk this book is none of those provided what he hoped that they might provide. So, well, what does this book have to do with me today? My friends, we also live in a world today that says, if you just, then you'll be happy. If you can just get that, if you can just have that relationship, I remember thinking in my life like that. We, we all do this, right? If I can just accomplish this one thing. I remember before I finished my doctorate, I thought if I can just get this degree and I can just get this title, I will, I will have arrived. I will have accomplished something significant. And then you get it and then guess what? You don't think about it hardly ever again. Or you think right before, when you're in college or in high school or whatever, and you're, you're thinking about your future, like if I could just find that special someone to get married to, if I could just have a family, then I'll find fulfillment and purpose and meaning in my life. And, and those are good things. I mean, family is a good thing. But my friend, if, if that's what we're seeking our contentment in, we're going to find out quickly that that's not going to be the source of our contentment. If we think, if I could just pay off my house, if I could just get that big job, if I could just pay my bills, if I could, it's always if I could just do this, then I will be. And this text is going to remind us over and over again that all of the things of the world never provide long-term satisfaction and fulfillment. And that's why we get to the end there in chapter 12. And what does Solomon say? I've, I've surveyed it all. I've had it all, I've seen it all, I've known it all, I've experienced it all, and it comes down to this in the end, it's about a relationship with God. Because He's the only one that's going to provide fulfillment and meaning in my life. And so I don't know where you are today, I don't know what you're pursuing, I don't know what the things of your life look like, but but I want you to hone in on this as we work through this book. What is the purpose and meaning of my life because just like those bubbles I blew it goes by just like that let's keep going I've got four realities in this text I want us to wrestle with this morning and I mean wrestle with because they're not easy they might be a little I've tried to word them in a way that they're a little bit uh, catchy but they're not easy things to really ponder the first one is this life is short and then you die I don't want to oversimplify that, but life is short, and every one of us is going to die. Barring the return of Christ, we're going to die. Look at verse 2. Vanity of vanities, said the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So in the second verse, we've already heard the word vanity five times. Now, what does this word even mean? It's used eventually 38 times in the book. It's the Hebrew word hevel, which means emptiness, futility, vapor, that which vanishes quickly and leaves nothing behind, just like those bubbles. 
They were blown, they floated for a minute, and then they disappeared, and there's no trace that they were ever here. Interestingly, this word Havel is where we get the name Abel, as in Cain and Abel, because his life was there, and Cain cut it short. It's nothing but a vapor. Whatever disappears quickly leaves nothing behind. This is Havel. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, immediately after the fall of man. And when God had created man to walk with him in the garden and to live in eternity with him, what happens after sin comes into the world? Here is part of the curse. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Or James 4, verse 14. Yet do you not know what tomorrow will bring? What is your life? Good question. Solomon's going to help us with that question. James tells us the answer to that question. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. That is the Hebrew word for Havel, this idea of something that is there and then it is not. And that is the story of our lives. We are here today, but gone tomorrow. How many of us, unless you're like a major genealogical buff and you've traced out your family tree, how many of us can say that we knew our great-great-grandparents? Maybe you have a picture, if you're lucky, of maybe them holding you as a small child, but really none of us know our great-great-grandparents, and none of us probably know our great-great-grandparents, right? So we can't really tell anything about their lives. We don't think about them regularly, and if we keep going back, our great-great-great-great-grandparents, we couldn't probably even name them. I can't name mine, and yet I'm here because they were there. And I can't even name them. And they may have done significant things in their lives. And yet, I don't even know their names. For the vast majority of us, and I don't want to be a downer, but that's really how this book starts. <laughs> I don't want to be a downer, but we're two to three generations from being completely forgotten. There'll be no remembrance. And even if somebody remembers us, they won't care. Because they don't know us. They don't know what we're about. They don't know our heart. They don't know if we're funny or serious. That's life. And then I think Solomon wants us to understand early on that the quicker we can get a grasp on what life looks like, and the quicker we can get a grasp on how long eternity is in light of how short life is, It'll give us meaning in the life that we live because now we'll understand it's short. But eternity's long. And what we do in the shortness of life impacts the eternity long. Life is short and then you die. The second reality I think we ought to see in this text this morning is that the world moves along with or without you. The world moves along with or without you. Look at verse 5. The sun rises and the sun goes down. And it hastens to the place where it rises. So he begins by giving us the example of the sun. He says the sun rises and then the sun sets. And then the sun rises and then the sun sets. And then the sun rises and then the sun sets. And if you die tomorrow, guess what's going to happen? The sun's going to rise and the sun's going to set. And if I die the next week, the sun's going to rise, and the sun's going to set. And when everyone in this room is gone in a hundred years, the sun's going to rise, and the sun's going to set. It's been like that for 6,000 years. And barring the return of Christ, it will be like that for 6,000 more. And then he gives us another example. The wind blows to the south, and it goes to the north. Around and around it go, goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. 
The wind is blowing and the wind will continue to blow. It'll blow this way and that way, up and down, east and west, north and south. And if you're gone tomorrow, the wind will keep blowing. And then he gives us a third example. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow. There they flow again. What is he describing? He's describing how the water flows into the sea, it evaporates, it goes into clouds, it rains in other places, it causes streams, streams flow into the sea, it evaporates, it goes back over and over and over. And if I'm not here to see it, doesn't make a stop. And if you're not here to see it, it just keeps going. Are you depressed yet? That's why I said earlier on, you don't see a lot of Ecclesiastes and devotional guides. Like, I need my morning with Jesus. Oh, this, oh, wait, I'm not going to be here for that. It's like Ferris Bueller in the old 1980s movie said, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you may just miss it. Third reality I want us to see in the text this morning is that nothing is new except for the packaging. Nothing is new except for the packaging. There are things, and some of you are older than me, but you've seen things, I've seen things, but there are some things that we buy today that are exactly the same as my parents bought when I was a kid and their parents bought when they were kids, and the only thing that's different about it is the packaging it comes in. I mean, I think like ivory soap. We have ivory soap in our house. It is exactly the same kind of soap that I had when I was a kid 40 years ago. And it's pretty much exactly the same kind of soap my grandparents had 50 years before that. It, the only thing that's changed is the, now it comes in a bottle, or now it comes in a different wrapper, or, but it's the same. Things just stay the same. There's nothing new. We keep thinking, oh, I've discovered something new. No, you haven't. It's just a repackaging, a remodel of whatever was there before. Because to say that there's something new means that I have created or some human has created something out of nothing. Only God creates something out of nothing. Everything that exists has been created by him. We just put it together this way or that way or this way or that way, but it's not new. There's not any new concept under the sun. You see, the more we read, the more we understand, the more we look into the history, the more we see how things tend to repeat themselves. Sure, they take a little different form. Sure, they have a slight variation on them, but there's nothing new under the sun. Look at verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. I love verse 9. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been, it has been already in the ages before. Solomon's like, I've seen it. I've traveled. I I go to places. And and they'll say, look at this new thing that I've seen. And then I'll go somewhere else and I'll go, that's already been discovered. It's already been developed. It's not new. It's just repackaging of the old. It's interesting that Paul, when he gets to Athens and he goes up on Mars Hill, it talks about the, the, uh, the philosophers there. They sat there to talk about all of the things that are new. A new idea that had come to town. A a, a new traveler going through, sharing ideas on the top of Mars Hill with the philosophers. I thought of something new. And Paul, in his way, just kind of embraces that concept as the same foolishness that Solomon does and is reminded that no, God is the creator and He is the only one who brings about those things. Verse 10, is there a thing of which is said, see, this is new, it has, already been, it has already been there ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after. Life is short. There's nothing 
new. And then lastly, where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning is the fourth reality of the text. Meaning and purpose isn't found in human wisdom. It must come from our Creator. This is the argument he's building towards in this chapter and really throughout this book is that as long as we are looking for purpose and meaning in the things under the sun, as long as we're looking for purpose and meaning in the things created by man, as long as we're looking for purpose and meaning in these things that we think, oh, I've got a new thing. There's a new thought. There's a new job. There's a new package. There's a new whatever. As long as we're pursuing those things, we will not find the meaning and purpose of life. We, we cannot find it in human thought. We cannot find it in human ingenuity. We cannot find it in human possession. It must come from our Creator. See, the Creator is the only one that puts value on something, that gives meaning to something. I think I've shared this before, but uh, several years ago, my parents got to this place where they're like, we're going to clean out our house, which really meant we're going to get rid of all of my junk that I'd left there. So, you know, I had a bedroom at our house, obviously, and I, then I went off to college, and I came back and stayed there some, and then I got married, and I got my own place, and yet in my closet in my bedroom remained, you know, my Boy Scout uniform, and some knickknacks, and some high school memorabilia, and some trophies, and, you know, some scrapbook, whatever. It was, you know, in there. Baseball cards, things that I had kept throughout my childhood, and they decided it was time to clean out the closet, so they just came with a couple boxes and pretty much just dropped it off on my, at my house. So, yeah, this is your stuff. See, I had, you know, for them, they could have just as well thrown it out. You know, it, it didn't have a lot of meaning to them. They had kept the stuff that they wanted from my childhood or whatever, but it's time to drop off my stuff. See, I had meaning and value in that because I was the owner of it. And so I would look at things that they would see as junk and I would say, oh, that's important. We can't throw that away. I remember when, I remember when I got that. I remember when I did that. And I could place meaning and value on that because I was the owner of it. Whereas somebody else will look at it and go, it's just stuff. It has no value to me. And see, God looks down and He can place meaning and value in our life because He is the creator and the owner of our lives. And see, God is, as sovereign and as creator, finds that meaning and value, and he tells you and I that if we want to know that meaning and value, we will find it only when we look to him. Because if we look to something else that's created, we will not find the owner's instructions or the owner's value in it. So meaning and purpose isn't found in human wisdom. It has to come from our creator. Look at verse 12. I, the preacher have been king over, king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. And let me tell you, my friends, Solomon did. He was a well-traveled man. He was an extremely knowledgeable man. He had people come from all around the world. This was the, the focal point, one of the center points in all of the world at that time. King Solomon in his glory. And he says, I sought to find out all that there was to know about wisdom. Of everything all over the globe that was happening, I was going to find out about it. And then he says these interesting words. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Because if you know anything about knowing, you know that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Once we think that we have arrived at the place of knowledge, we only discover that we have only scratched the surface. And so, chasing knowledge, Solomon says, chasing wisdom, chasing insight, is a fool's game. Because the more you chase it as your purpose, he's not saying it's not important, he's not saying we shouldn't get smarter, he's not saying don't go to school, he's just saying if that's the end goal for you, so I'm going to be the smartest person. I want to have all these degrees. I want to know everything there is to know. Then you're really going to be discouraged in your life because you're going to realize, I don't know anything. He goes on and he says, 
It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. There's that word again, havel. There is emptiness. All of it is empty. All of it is chasing after the wind. You can't catch the wind. You can only run after it. And about the time you think you're running in the right direction, guess what happens? It just changes direction on you. What's he saying when he's saying we're chasing after one? He says, you're chasing something that's uncatchable. He says, what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. You're trying to count something. Like if somebody said to you, well, count the wind. What, what do you even mean by that? Or Chris Rice once wrote a song called, Smell the Color Nine. Not doable. Because you're mixing things that have no business being mixed. And it, what you're asking somebody to do is not possible to do. And what Solomon is saying is chasing after the things of this world is, is, is not fulfilling. It's, you're going to do all this work and you're going to end up with nothing. Just like those bubbles. And then he says in verse 16, I said in my heart... I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. And then look at the depth of insight of verse 18. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. In 1998, I went on my first international mission trip to Namibia, Africa. And I was 22 years old, got on a plane, went by myself, met up with a group in London, and then we flew the rest of the way. My parents were freaking out because I'm 23, like, two months out of college or something like that. And uh, here I'm going halfway across the world on my first international mission trip. I was so fired up. I knew nothing, but I was so fired up. I still know nothing, but a mission still fires me up. So get over to Namibia, Africa. And I mean, all I had known, honestly, I just grew up in a middle class subdivision kid in Nashville. Went to a decently good high school. Went to a Baptist college. I mean, let's just say my life had some shelter around it. And we show up in Namibia, Africa, and at first everything is fine, good. And then the missionaries took us out to the bush. And for a kid who's grown up and seen poverty in the United States, but never thought about living in a mud hut, where every day you walk half a mile to bring your water to your hut, to your village, that everything in there is a process. Like there's not a refrigerator, so you don't just go get a drink. There's not food in a storage bin, so you just open up and get some bread out. They make everything. They grow everything. If they eat it, it's because they've grown it or killed it. And you know what I took away from that? It wasn't, oh, I feel sorry for these people. They're in such poverty. You know what I took away from that? These are the happiest people I've ever met. They legitimately enjoyed their life. They sat. They talked. They sang. They danced. They cooked. They played with their kids. Their kids played with other kids. They never thought about what I don't have. I mean, maybe they thought about it, but I'm convinced they didn't want it. Because they legitimately were content. And then I come back, and I'm only in college, or just out of college, so I don't have nothing, right? I just have a degree, a piece of paper, and an opportunity. And you get here, and you're like, I've got to make it. 
I gotta get a house. I gotta get an apartment. I gotta get some furniture. I gotta get this. I gotta get a wife. I gotta get. I gotta get school. I gotta. And I, I just so much relate to verse eighteen. For in much wisdom is much vexation. See, those wonderful people in the bush of Namibia, they weren't feeling vexed at all. They didn't. I mean, I had a college degree. Most of them still were speaking orally. They didn't even read things. So in, in our world, in our culture, it would be so easy to say, well, see how more advanced we are. Like, we've got, look, we've got microphones and piano. And it's the world that just sucks us into that thinking. That somehow we're, our culture is better than that. Or look how far more developed and how smarter, much smarter we are and wiser we are and all of these things. And I see Solomon saying, for in much wisdom is much, much, much vexation and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Sometimes the more you know, the more you have, the more you've experienced, the less content you are. Some of the most content people I've ever met are the most generous people because they've learned that what gives them the contentment in their possessions is not keeping them, but giving them. Same thing with knowledge. Some of the wisest people I've ever met are not the people who hoard the information to themselves, but teach others with it. It's about giving it away, not hoarding it together. Paul's, or the writer of Ecclesiastes here, Solomon, is saying there's much wisdom in understanding, but it creates much sorrow. So, as we think about this text, as we think about what direction Solomon is writing here and where it ends, it can be so easy to pause and go, well, this is the most pessimistic thing I've ever read. I mean, what is Solomon getting at? He's telling us, you know, life is short. It's nothing but a vapor. He's telling us, hey, pursue all the wisdom you want. You won't make you happy. He's saying there's nothing new under the sun. Quit striving your whole life to find out something new only to find out it's not new. This is discouraging. And that's why we ought to read this book in light of what we understand about Jesus in the New Testament. See, this is the... The, the wonderful thing about living on that, this side of the cross is that we can read what Solomon is striving for, what Solomon is writing about, about the experience that he's had in light of the crucifixion and resurrection. And see, when Jesus says this in John chapter 10, we ought to say yes and amen. He says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. That they may have a fulfilled life, a satisfied life, a life that is meaningful. I have come that you can have life, eternal life, not a vapor life, not a life that's like a bubble that it's here for a second, pops and is gone, but Jesus has come that you and I might have abundant and eternal life. And the life that he's given us here on this earth might have purpose and meaning. And the purpose and meaning, as we read about even in Ecclesiastes, will never be found in stuff. It'll never be found in wisdom. It'll never be found in schooling. It'll only be found in God. So we read that in John chapter 10 from the mouth of Jesus and we also read things like Paul's declaration in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he says, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Why can we live and work and serve and give and, and, and experience all that God has for us and it not be in vain? Why? Because we rest in Christ, in Him Paul began that book, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, by saying that, that Jesus Christ became to us wisdom from God. Where is ultimate wisdom found? In Jesus Christ. He 
is our wisdom. He is our truth. He is our life. It's no wonder he says these words, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And if you want to find meaning and purpose in your life, you will only find it in Jesus. So I don't know what you're striving after. I have a feeling, and because I'm looking at my own life, there are areas of my own life, probably you as well, where you've been pursuing things. And they may be good things. It's not just evil things. It's not just sinful things. We can pursue good things that God created, that He intended for us to enjoy, but they, if the creation becomes more important than the Creator... We will not find the purpose and meaning and enjoyment the way God intended. And so what is it that you're pursuing? Are you pursuing the wisdom of the world? Are you pursuing, as 1 Corinthians 1 says, the wisdom from God, which is Christ? My prayer is that you and I would pursue Christ and we would find our meaning, our meaning of life in Him. We would find our purpose for life because He gives it abundantly to all who will come to Him and ask. Have you invited Christ into your life? Have you put Jesus as the Lord and Master and Teacher of your life? If not, He invites you today to call upon His name. For the Scripture says there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Have you named Him? Have you called upon Him? Have you put your faith in Him? If not, now is the time. 